I've been so proud of the team. Uh, Allison's one of them, Ali's one of them uh, here at Global Giving that's been working on this. Um, and I'm thrilled that we get to share more about it more publicly. And I've also been extremely grateful for the time, the energy, um, the emotion that so many partners have invested. You can see again, some faces on the gallery view and then you've seen in the comments that we've had the participation of a lot of folks, a lot of folks thinking and contributing in this conversation. Um, and part of this gratitude, frankly, is pure self-interest. <laughs> so I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. I started um, as CEO here at Global Giving uh, about two and a half years ago, November of 2018. And the first big dilemma under my watch happened in November of 2018. So I started officially on November 1st and it was within three weeks into my new role at, a new, at an organization new to me that a nonprofit partners of, of ours was the subject of a, a scathing news article uh, accusing it of significant abuses of the people in its care. And in delving deeply, it, it soon became clear that this wasn't just a sort of straightforward case of an accused wrongdoing. It actually involved some nuanced, deeply supported, and yet ultimately conflicting perspectives on how to best respect the rights and serve the interests of a community of people. Uh, and again, just to make it about me for a second, um, that it knocked me off balance. I was, I was unprepared. I felt unprepared and I was unprepared. Um, I was being asked to make a high stakes decision um, with little to go on um, ultimately, other than my own intuition, and that intuition felt uh, woefully lacking. Um, I even panicked a bit, I'll admit. Um, um, but some good came out of that. Um, you know, it highlighted our need, uh, a need that we had and that we continue to have, and that's a need to have a way to make uh, and resolve ethical dilemmas. Um, but make those decisions in a way that respect the trust that's placed in us by our partners and that don't just rely on sort of personal gut feeling about right and wrong. Um, this ties back to our origin. You know, Global Giving was founded almost 20 years ago um, as an open platform. In fact, openness is built into our corporate values. And one of the ways that, that openness aspiration represents itself is that we seek to be a platform so that anybody engaged in social work anywhere in the world can use us as a way to raise money online. Um, you might even say that we seek to be a neutral channel for people to support important social work. But that aspiration for neutrality gets challenged, uh, challenged by dilemmas like the one that, um, that we were facing you know, within three weeks, November 2018, um, and others. Um, and you know, with just a little bit of thought, I think we can call to mind some examples that are really tough, right? What about organizations um, and communities that practice female genital mutilation? What about groups that promote vaccine hesitancy um, at all, or, and especially during a global pandemic? Should we partner with companies or influencers, even if they'd be fruitful partnerships if those industries or those personalities are controversial and open us up to risk from association. Um, these are the kinds of decisions that, that uh, face platforms like us. Um, and they're kinds of decisions that you can't avoid making. You know, Even a non-decision ends up being a decision. And so we started calling this neut the neutrality paradox. Um, it started to point to the reality that platforms, platform leaders need to take stands, but, but raise the question of how to do that and how to do that effectively. Um, so that's what we're gonna be talking about today. We have found just so much uh, critical support from friends and peers. It was early on um, in my journey here and in our work that we turned to some of the people that you see here, Jacob, Michael, um, Teresa, um, you're gonna hear from Mahati as well. Um, and we all agreed, um, and others, by the way, in the chat, and you saw some of this, um, you know, folks mentioning their participation in, in the chat. Um, and there was, even though there was um, complexity in this question, there was agreement that we needed a better way. 
Uh, and so you're going to hear from some of these folks um, about how they've been working on this, their stories. Um, and so with gratitude, I will turn it back over to Allison to invite the next story. Thank you so much, Alex. Jacob, I wonder if you could take us back to the moment when you and Alex first started talking about the challenges of platform neutrality. I'd love to hear what you were experiencing and what you were worried about at the time. Sure, we can go back to 2016. And at the time I was the, the CEO of GuideStar and Alex was a member of our board of directors. And this is before the merger that formed uh, Candid and before Alex came to, to Global Giving. And as we all remember, 2016 was a time when we saw a rise in hateful rhetoric and unfortunately in hateful action. And we at GuideStar started to hear demands from some of our users and partners to provide information to help people make decisions informed by at least some data about whether an organization might be contributing to this. Um, and we decided to move quickly. So we took the list of um, put together by the Southern Poverty Law Center of hate groups, and we cross-referenced that with our list of nonprofits, we found 46 matches, and put a little banner up at the top of each, uh, each one. Um, and we put it up, and nobody noticed it for a couple of weeks, and then we got a call from the Associated Press. Um, and we quickly came to realize just how controversial these ratings were um, and just how caught up they were in the broader culture wars in this moment of political polarization um, and how hard it is to, to define hate um, and quickly became the object of a campaign on the part of some of these organizations and their allies to take down this, this data. A number of press articles, especially in the right-wing media, but not, not, not only in the right-wing media, um, uh, some threats uh, and two lawsuits in federal court. Um, so it was, it was quite a serious situation. Um, and so we, we paused and we tried to learn more. We, we talked to experts in the field. We actually went to some of these organizations to get their perspective. And it was, became very clear that good people could, could disagree. Um, now, we actually had assumed that from the beginning in that we would, we would never say this organization is a hate group. Instead, what we were saying is we are an information platform. We are sharing that someone else has said that. And that is, that is objective information, even if the choice itself is subjective. But that's a pretty nuanced argument to make in a moment of, of, of polarization. And after much discussion, we decided to, to pull these, uh, these ratings from our site. They were still available elsewhere. And you know, that left us unsatisfied and that we had not been able to solve a problem facing society in our sector. Also proud that we had confronted this dilemma so directly and tried to be transparent about it. I wrote an op-ed in the Chronicle Philanthropy describing the experience and our rationale. Um, and I think ultimately it made us stronger, um, but it was a moment of real fragility for us. And um, so when we heard about the, the ethos effort, you know, we were excited to, to share our experience and then learn because we know that we're going to face more dilemmas like this going forward. Um, and maybe some that are even harder um, than that one. Um, and uh, as we, we haven't given up that there's some role that we could play in helping to address hateful rhetoric in the nonprofit sector, um, we still haven't figured out how. Um, and so our, our hope is that this community of platforms that are struggling with these related issues can, can help us. And so um, we've been involved uh, for quite some time now and you know, took a look at the, the prototype and um, and went deep with Allison and, and others um, looking at, you know, a very sophisticated matrix and, and realized that, that actually, you know, the point here is not to answer these dilemmas for us. The point here is to facilitate useful conversations um, that get us to better answers. And um, I think we've made progress collectively, but, you know, we still have a long way to go. Thank you so much, Jacob. Yes, we learned so much from your team as we spent hours together in a conference room wrestling over this decision matrix that we were building out together. Um, and the, the conclusion that we came to that it's really about an important conversation um, rather than a properly weighted algorithm was really a pivot point for us in our, in our initial um, prototype. So I'm so thankful that we've been able to work with you on this. All right, well, then next, Michael, as a peer and friend of Jacob's, 
I know that you are watching the case that he described, um, and you know you are also dealing with your own neutrality paradox situations. So, how were you feeling at the time? I think 2016. Well, thank you, Allison. And, and um, 2016 was an interesting time, not just in the increase in, in uh, rhetoric, but we were also going through a very heated election cycle at that time. And one of the things that uh, charity navigators stumbled into was some of the nonprofits that we evaluate also have political affiliations. And so issuing a rating on, in this case, the Clinton Foundation in the year 2016 proved to be a lightning rod and gave the perception of bias where we were actually in our, in our actual beliefs acting as the evaluator and providing you know, ratings on an organization. This was then um, the other area where this got confounded for us is also with what we, as an information resource, we, we issue um, or we create curated lists or what we call hot topics of highly rated organizations that are focused on specific issues. And those specific issues also in our, in our how they're created, they tend to exhibit another bias, which is, for example, uh, something we come under fire for in the month of June, we'll run an LGBTQ pride uh, list, which is helping people find organizations focused on that specific um, domain. And that often really, um, we get assaulted at that point and our staff is subject to um, some pretty, pretty rough uh, feedback. And so having processes for how do we create these lists? What do we do when we're getting that kind of negative feedback is not always, it, that's not always clear and um, hasn't, hasn't been easy for us. The one thing is um, we are also a platform similar to Candid, which is hosting the full IRS business master file. And so what that means is that there is a multitude of organizations in there that are doing all kinds of different things. As an organization, we have, as a point of pride, not focused on mission as a part of our evaluations. That said, our ratings have evolved and our services to donors have evolved significantly over the 20 years we've been in existence. We have, we have, we have enabled the ability to give money directly to nonprofits in our database. We're, you know, currently we've had about 200,000 individuals make donations through our giving basket, and that's amounted to over $120 million going to about 40,000 different nonprofits. The question that we're debating and don't necessarily have a good answer for at this time is if an organization is part of the hate groups or practicing hateful rhetoric, should we consider not necessarily facilitating donations because this is something that's conflicting with our specific mission and our values? And having a process to actually decide, is it a hateful group? What is, what is the, um, I think the other part about the, what I love about the way ethos has evolved is it's ensuring that all the right stakeholders are in place so that you can actually make an informed decision, but also potentially and when appropriate include the individual or organization that is um, being questioned. Uh, our current processes for inappropriate behavior at Charity Navigator are the advisory system, which has a committee, it's an internal process looking at very specific third party data, similar to the way um, GuideStar used the Southern Poverty Law um, symbols. It's third party data. We're not actually validating it ourselves. So it's objective from the third party source. That doesn't include some of these more nuanced areas which are not necessarily legal infringements or um, Un unclear from a legal or um, eth ethical standpoint. And so that's where 
having ethos um, evolve, being a part of that whole deliberation was really important to us at Charity Navigator. It also, I think what you've done by creating some basic templates and forms and formulas for moving forward really helps us as a, as a sector and also as the different platform players begin the journey of figuring out the right, right behavior. And then really importantly, taking corrective action if the decision we make is not necessarily the right one. We know why we did it, we can justify it, and then we can undo it and, and, and rerun the process again. Thank you, Michael. Sorry, I was on mute there. Yes, and you know, Global Giving has had so many similar challenges about which causes we end up highlighting. So I appreciate you sharing your experience there. Teresa, um, you've been sharing some really compelling neutrality paradox examples from your work in Germany. And over the past years, you wrote a very interesting article in Alliance Magazine, and you also spoke at the IG Advisors Curation with a Constance event with us in London in early 2020. And one of the things you spoke about was how platforms and intermediaries like ours have been affected by decisions made by companies with whom they partner. So that in specifically that meant payment providers. So I wonder if you could talk about your experience with that. Gladly, thank you, Alison. And um, thanks also, Jacob and Michael. I can so relate to what you said because that's also what we face, these dilemma situations at Better Place, which is, Alison just said it, um, an, an online fundraising platform in Germany, just like Global Giving in the US. And yes, that's basically adding yet another dilemma to what you just described, what we've just heard, um, is when it's not only about our own risk assessment procedures and decision-making procedures, which is complicated enough, but if there is a third party who also wants to have a say in that. And this could be, it could be corporate clients, it could be corporation partners. In this case that you're referring to, Alison, it was actually a service provider, a payment service provider, um, uh, which is not just any partner, uh, quite important, of course. And um, we found that la late last year that um, one of our payment service providers decided that it was not within their risk tolerance anymore to support projects who give money to Syria. And of course, we've got a lot of charities on our platform who work in, in, in Syria. And if that's I don't know, Save the Children or UNICEF and, and, and organizations, organizations like that, they, they they can get on without the income stream that is better place for them, of course. Um, they didn't like it that we had to limit their, their payment method options, but they don't have to, you know, they're not at risk of having to stop their work. But there are other organizations, one in particular that, that I talked to, I had long, long talks with um, last winter, small organization, German, not international, had sprung from a private initiative, really heartfelt what, what these people do. We've been working with them for, for years and um, they, they are small, but they generate tremendous impact in Syria. So they really make a change there for, for lots of people's lives. And basically Better Place is their main stream of, of, of funding for, for their work. So if we have to limit that, immediately it leads to people in Syria suffering and this organization not being able to do their work anymore. So fortunately in that situation, we weren't forced to take the organization off the platform, so to de-platform it, but that could have happened. It could have very well happened. We had to negotiate. So how are we gonna do this? And only, only had to cut down payment method options. Um, but it, is, is, it shows how much power these third parties can have over, over platforms like us. And, and I know that we also not, not alone because something that um, Donna, who I think is also on the call here tonight, I, I saw her name popping up. Hello, Donna, nice to see you again. Um, whom I met at the first convening for, for this project um, one and a half years ago. And it really stuck with me what, what she told us about um, her organization's work in Palestine, which some international donors find, you know, difficult to deal with, a bit messy, difficult to judge, and so they draw back from, from supporting that work. And then platforms hear that and see that, and they just follow and, and then, you know, also don't want to take the risk, and the risk is to de-platform, that they get de-platformed as well, with the same effect that I just described. And what I 
what I hope that ethos can can help with is that, that platforms like ours and, and other other players in this field don't just follow the example of others or third party rules or just go the easiest way um, to avoid any risks, but are a little bit more brave and encouraged to actually have these debates and conversations that, that we've already heard a little bit about. And, and I, I think it can definitely help uh, along that way as well. Absolutely, Teresa, thank you so much for that example. That was absolutely something we found in our early research and talking to different platform um, leaders was that, yeah, they actually admit they are leaning on one another because they don't have a way to make these decisions for themselves. It's too much work. And so then we end up in this echo chamber where a few power, very powerful people are making decisions. And so I've been really impressed by the way that you and Better Place have done this internal work to not only identify your own values, but also your beliefs and what that actually means about what you stand for. So thank you so much for being part of this work and for sharing with us today. All right, I was hoping we might have time for um, all of you to ask questions of one another, but I, th I think we're gonna have to move on. Um, but I'm so thankful that you've all been sharing your stories here. I'm gonna share my screen again and here we go. I just wanna reiterate that what we've been hearing from our colleagues here is really just a snapshot of the conversations we started to have two years ago. I interviewed people from 16 organizations to build this database of 41 examples of platform dilemmas. And people spoke of these ethical dilemmas as a huge burden on their organization and on their personal conscience as leaders. Dilemmas are becoming more common and more threatening. Just yesterday in a United States Senate congressional hearing, um, Joan Donovan, a Harvard researcher said, and I quote, the biggest problem facing our nation is misinformation at scale and the cost of doing nothing is democracy's end. So misinformation on platforms and what we do about it is not really the only type of dilemma that platforms face, but it is one of them. Um, and tech platforms like ours aren't the only companies facing threats. Nonprofit leaders, philanthropy leaders, we are all experiencing these dilemmas. And they're becoming more common because of social media and globalization as the world becomes more complex. With social media, of course, the risk of exposure is greater and the demand for better decisions is greater. There's also a growing burden on leadership to make better decisions and a changing expectation among customers and especially among employees that leaders make ethical, defensible decisions. So I'm sure that you've all felt it at your organizations, your staff wanting to know what the leadership position is on police violence or climate change, or what you're gonna do about a partner who's just been the focus of a Me Too sexual harassment accusation. This growing complexity and these calls for accountability from our stakeholders aren't bad. In fact, many times it's exactly what we need and, and we should applaud them. And they don't have to be scary for organizations. It just simply means that responsive organizations need to design for that complexity and prepare for these inevitable dilemmas. And I wanna note that we've seen several companies get this wrong in the past year in the United States. So we all watch different companies and platforms take different stands after the January 6th siege of the US Capitol. And the irony was that it's not that these organizations or companies didn't see this post-election crisis coming. We all knew the country was ripe for chaos, and yet still some companies were prepared with these well thought out responses and others were clearly very reactive just doing what others did. And companies are still learning from their decisions there. In another example, a few months ago, a tech executive made an explicit statement about not taking a stand on social issues at the company and that company immediately lost 60 employees within a couple of days. And the same thing happened literally just this week with another well-known tech company that banned social and political conversations among employees. And that fallout on social media has been severe. There was a well-respected author and DEI specialist named Lily Zhang, who commented on the case yesterday saying that moves like this are designed to help an organization focus by simply just being neutral and focusing on their work. However, that approach increases interpersonal and institutional discrimination because it lacks empathy 
and it increases justification of inequality. And reduced empathy and increased justification of inequality is exactly what we need to be working against right now. And we, as a community, knew that neutrality isn't the answer. And we also know that the number of dilemmas is going to continue to increase. So we have to build competency as organizations and leaders to be proactive and take on tough conversations. And it's not just about having a crisis comms plan for when these crises do happen, but it's about having a process for addressing the core problems at the root of the dilemmas. So what might a better way look like? Well, here's what we heard from interviews in our testing. First, that leaders want to know that they've done an appropriate job of engaging their stakeholders and they're not bearing the weight of a decision on their own. They wanna feel confident in their decisions and they want their teams to feel confident. They wanna be able to provide a clear narrative to explain why they're making decisions. They wanna reduce risk to themselves and their organizations. In fact, we had user test subjects who weren't executives talking about, they have this real anxiety about getting fired for making a misstep during a big crisis like this. And they wanna know that there's something, a process, something that they can rely on. They wanted a common framework endorsed by other trusted organizations that would provide a sense of certainty when they're making decisions. And finally, perhaps most importantly, they told us, we want all of this, but it can't take all of my time. So people need a solution that's going to make it possible to have important conversations in a short amount of time. So now I'm going to introduce my colleague, Ellie McLaren, one of Global Giving's original staff members and current designer in residence. She's been working with us on this for over a year, and she's going to talk briefly about how we found a path forward. Thank you, Allison. It's good to be here with all of you. Uh, the good news is that this is not a slide um, to um, talk about human-centered design. It's actually just about why we found human-centered design to be the right process and how we used it. So we did need a better framework, uh, and we recognize that this is a problem that is faced by so many diverse organizations. And so we've heard a lot from our social sector partners, but it was actually, it was shared by so many others, including, um, you know, our, many of our tech companies that we partner with, our corporations that we partner with. And so we recognize that there is real value in co-creating. We also had this sort of like bold statement, which is that nobody um, in terms of social media companies, tech companies have figured out how to do that well. And we asked ourselves, what if we in the social sector could offer a solution? And that was a really bold and juicy challenge. We also knew that our solution needed to focus on our shared humanity, on empathy and on equity. And that's why we chose a human-centered design approach. We wanted to solve for a very gnarly human problem in the most human way that we could. And human-centered design invites us to go through these cycles of divergence and convergence to understand the right problem and to develop sound solutions and not just develop them, but test them. So we went through two to three or three to four, I think, yeah, cycles over the course of two years. Over a hundred people participated, including nonprofit leaders from around the world, corporate leaders, technology leaders, foundation leaders, and platform executives. We conducted interviews, we hosted a convening, we developed and tested prototypes in large work, workshops and small deep dive sessions in four countries. We ran a design sprint using all of that data um, to translate that into, um, to develop and, and, and to test new new prototypes uh, that we were developing specifically for global giving at the time. And spoiler alert, uh, we have been um, implementing ethos and using it to manage dilemmas. And um, Alex is going to share uh, some good, a good story um, about that. Um, and we also kind of recognized that we wanted to go back to this challenge, which is like, what if we could uh, develop a solution that would work for others? So then we did more user research to understand if we were to productize this and translate it into a market facing way, what would that look like? And then we developed it, we tested it further and we're rolling it out today, which I think brings all of us a great degree of satisfaction and joy to share it with you. 
So I just want to, I'm going to talk just at a high level, like real quick meta um, level about sort of what it actually meant um, for sort of like some of the transitions that we're talking about. So our solution and ethos represents some key shifts, um, both in the ways that organizations have traditionally thought about solving dilemmas and shifts in our original thinking about what a collective solution could and would look like. Uh, so the first prototypes were only about process. They focused on coming to agreement around values. Allison tells really great stories and has written a number of blog posts about workshops where people were tasked with prioritizing values that they could then use as a lens to make decisions. Um, but they'd spend the entire hour debating the definition of one or two terms and never came to an agreement uh, that would enable them to move forward. The initial prototypes also um, were only afforded binary options. Should we partner with this or shouldn't we? Should we deplatform this organization or shouldn't we? Um, with not much space in between. And we, we built out decision-making charts and frameworks and decision trees, trying to name and quantify all the different types of considerations. And those failed in practice. And what succeeded was rich conversations. People really valued rich structured conversations and could come to their own conclusions or their own outcomes at the end of those conversations, having heard from one another, having listened to one another. It reinforced that we are often working with imperfect information and um, in these complex dilemmas, we really need diverse perspectives and rich lived experiences to help us uh, make more confident and better decisions that serve people. And we believe that rich conversations would and they did come from these conversations, um, but we had to agree on how we were going to treat each other. And I'm not sure it's like rocket science that this came down to how do we actually have difficult conversations and how do we listen to each other? It shouldn't be rocket science, but um, it is, as so many have pointed to. So our solution really developed, um, that we developed represented key shifts um, in our early ways of thinking about dilemmas. So from pretending to be neutral to recognizing that our shared humanity comes with accountability and responsibility. From a utilitarian approach for problem solving, meaning the most good for the most many, um, to a multi-dimensional approach for tackling systemic dilemmas. From an organization-centric view of dilemmas to a community-led and human-centric view, and from binary choices, yes or no, on or off, to actually rustling um, and creatively resolving those tensions and coming up with a third option. Um, and so I'll just sort of end, I'm not going to drain this sort of slide around our principles, but we sort of really recognize that our principles are incredibly core to how we host conversations and gather intelligence, and that we really need to focus on these principles in all aspects of ethos. And so you'll see it in many different parts of the tools that we've developed, uh, but they really um, emphasize the fact that, um, that our relationships are not just core to the process, like they are ultimately what matters, and we need to sort of hold that precious uh, in the work that we do. Uh, so I'm going to hand it back over to Allison um, uh, to kind of actually like share ethos with you. You're on mute. Thank you. All right, so here it is. Finally, we will share ethos. Ethos includes a simple how-to guide that makes it clear what to do next in a dilemma. It includes tested tools and processes, each, each with a clear scope, um, discussion guides that create a safe, respectful way to engage people with different values and lived experiences. It includes templates and resources for all the confidentiality or transparency considerations and communication steps that need to happen along the way. So you can decide who are we involving um, and informing at what level when. And it also means that we prepare you at the end of the case. So when you get there, you really have these talking points already built out and ready to go for when you communicate with all your other stakeholders. And finally, ethos includes access to case studies about how other organizations are in addressing dilemmas. And perhaps in the future, we'll have access to a group of peers or consultants that you could go to sort for support. And for now, you have access to the Global Giving Ethos team if you want to use Ethos and you have questions. So this is the Ethos playbook. Um, you can see it live now on globalgiving.org ethos. It has five simple steps or chapters. The first is to prepare. We help you get folks together in the right room. Um, then frame, how do we um, think about what exactly is the problem that we're trying to solve? It turns out that actually is where you need to spend a lot of your time thinking about what is the problem we're really narrowing in on to get to the right solution. Then we give you the tools you need to interview stakeholders and write up a case brief. 
And then the next step is to ideate with what we call an ethos council. That's a group of five to seven stakeholders who have already been part of interviews and now you're bringing together to help you come up with creative solutions. The last step, of course, is to resolve. So we set the decision maker up for success to make and communicate a decision and an action plan. Each chapter in this playbook includes a set of capabilities, capabilities being the people, processes, and technology we need to address dilemmas. The tools and templates themselves are really flexible. So you're, I mean, they're literally just in Google Docs that you can make copies of and then work yourselves. And um, it helps you figure out exactly what your team needs. And, you know, what it comes down to is we know that you don't have all day to figure out how do you build out an interview guide or what do you put in your presentation deck? So we've done all that work for you. And these tools are all free and available on globalgiving.org slash ethos. Here are some examples of the tools. We have tools to help you understand and frame the problem. Is it an issue, which is like an isolated incident that could be a symptom of a larger problem? Or is it a true dilemma, a complex problem that's asking us to get to a root cause? We have tools to help you address, assess the level of confidentiality or transparency of the case, depending on what step you are in the process. And, you know, this is important because everyone needs to be on the same page about whether or not we can talk about a case that we're pursuing within the organization and outside of the organization. Another important piece of the playbook is these data tools. So after you've done a staff survey or you've conducted interviews, what do you literally do with that information? So this is an example of a tool to help you sort and store information from an interview. And then we've also thought about, okay, then how do you sort it and group it into patterns, for example, to analyze and synthesize that data? We walk you through those steps. And honestly, these are really great tools for a team to have, regardless of whether you're trying to address an ethos case or you're just trying to organize thoughts coming out of a brainstorming session or a strategic planning meeting. Um, Ellie brought these human-centered design tools and expertise to Global Giving for this project, but our staff has taken these tools and are really running with them for other projects as well. So these are capabilities that you can build through this process that will serve you beyond ethos dilemmas. And so we've tested all these tools, both in scenario planning and by running real world cases at Global Giving. And in the process of doing that, we recognize that some cases will surface um, that don't need an immediate or that need an immediate response, like a decision within days or even hours. And they may not require a full ethos exploration after that. So for those cases, there's a second playbook called Ethos Light. Ethos Light can be used to help you come to a decision about the next right step. It can be used in a few days or asynchronously, so it doesn't even require a meeting. And I like to think of it as like a triage process that ends with a Band-Aid. So the complete ethos process is more like a full diagnostic workup that leaves a patient with not just a Band-Aid, but a full care team and a support team to recover and meet their new normal. And ethos light is literally just what are we dealing with and how can we stop the bleeding? So these are two tools that are useful for different cases. So these are some screenshots of the website. Both playbooks are available on the website. We've heard from folks that they want to learn from their peers. So like I mentioned, there's case studies and op-eds on there. And there's also clear instructions and an invitation to reach out to us so that we can support your journey. Okay, with the time that we have left, I am excited to introduce um, two storytellers. So that Alex will come back and Mahati will come back to tell briefly about their stories um, dealing with dilemmas and using part of the ethos tools. And I think I'm, I'm going first, but I've You're already next. spoken. So uh, I want to make sure to leave enough time for uh, Mahati. What I will say is that this has been working. Um, you know, as we have started to, um, even in the beginning when we were working on the first iterations of uh, Ethos, I found that our conversations were shifting and our stances after decisions were shifting. You know, that example that I gave, um, the, the, the first dilemma, after we had made our decision, I could best um, characterize how I felt about that decision afterwards with like a fingers crossed emoji. Uh, the way that it felt was, oh, I hope no one asks me too many more questions about this, or I hope I don't get any more emails about this. 
um, it's not a very comfortable place to be, um, certainly not as a leader. And as we've been developing these tools, that has changed markedly. Um, where, well, now we're at the point where we're actually offering webinars about this and where um, uh, we're gonna be publishing anonymized case studies. Um, and so I'll just give you some of the insights from the first uh, full ethos case that we ran and more information will be available. It was, you know, it was not about a nonprofit partner. It was actually a, a question about partnering with a corporate partner and whether or not we should, we should do it. A few of the insights that came out um, were, uh, they speak to some of the uh, mindset shifts that Ellie spoke about. Um, room for, for creativity. It started out as a question about, should we partner with this company or not because of concerns about how they did do their work? And um, I'm pleased to say that it actually turned into a much broader and more fruitful conversation about some of those business practices and frankly, about ways that we could be better ourselves in work on data privacy, security, um, audience engagement, et cetera. Um, a second insight relates to, I think, points that both Allison and Ellie have made also, which is that unlike some of the other dilemmas, this first um, case, which related to a tech technology company, um, wasn't actually catalyzed by an external sort of threat some of these feel a bit like us versus them or us versus them versus them, you know, where there's a lawsuit or a news article or some complaint coming in, but actually this was internal. And so it spoke to the growing importance of internal stakeholders. Um, and I think that this is going to continue to be important. You know, Allison made reference to a tech company having the quite natural, I would say, knee jerk reaction of saying, actually, we're going to ban all political talk at work, no politics at work because it's not productive. But I can promise you that stance is ultimately going to fail. And uh, we did some learning about what is a way to actually provide a productive platform and also have open communication about what expectations people internally um, and our stakeholders can have about the alignment between our work and um, and individual values. Um, and then lastly, you know, this case um, uh, spoke to the limitations of that utilitarian calculus. If we had simply said, well, how much work, how much good does the funding from this company do? It would have completely overwhelmed the, um, the evaluation and analysis because it's a, the answer is it's a tremendous amount of good. But had we stopped there, we would have missed out on all of the richness, including some of the insights that I mentioned and others um, um, that, that we actually ended up gaining. I won't lie, it was tough. <laughs> it was emotional. Um, it was uncomfortable. Um, but ultimately, um, it, it worked. And we continue to learn from it. Um, and so uh, some of this will be up, up on the site. Um, uh, uh, and as, as will some of these insights. Thank you so much. Yes, that's right. That specific case study of our, our first ethos case is actually up on the website now. And so you can get into more details there about how we made decisions about our partnership with that specific technology company. All right, the next I'm going to introduce Mahati. Mahati is a leader of a nonprofit partner of ours called CDE. Uh, they've been fundraising on the Global Giving site since late 2016. And Mahati, you recently encountered a dilemma of your own and you used pieces of the first Ethos Light prototype to shape your decision-making. So I'd love for you to share that story. Absolutely, thanks. Uh, so our story is about a dilemma that surfaced with a small US-based clothing company that was planning to go to market with a product that featured a design made by indigenous women in the communities in which we work. A week before they launched, the company let us know that they wanted to promote our work while donating proceeds of the sale of this product. We were left with the question, should we, a Mexican nonprofit that defends citizens' rights, accept product proceeds from a, a US-based design company, implicating ourselves in what looks clearly to be cultural appropriation of an indigenous design? The dilemma was complex. It was about cultural appropriation. It was about business ethics and corporate social responsibility. 
as well as this concept of brand appropriation that happens when companies use nonprofits, uh, nonprofit brands for their own gain. We had to respond quickly, uh, but the dilemma and working through it still took a ton of time. We were only able to engage with e the ethos light tool partway through as it was still being developed, but it really did help to frame the conversation and our resolution. In the end, thanks also in part to Global Giving, encouraging us to take a very healing approach uh, that's informed by ethos. We have been able to offer a counter proposal to the clothing company where they donate 100 percent, where they can make an offer to donate 100 percent of the net gain from this line to one of the partner organizations that we incubate. And we would support this organization to review the proposal and make a decision for themselves while also providing backstop support should this organization and the company agree on a way forward. Uh, we're confident that this won't be the last case like this. I hope in the future we'll be able to use e the ethos tools from start to finish. The ethos light tool reminded us to really map out the, the stakeholders and their needs. It also helped us map out the risks of participating and not participating, uh, which there were many on, on either side, we felt like. And it also helped us think about how to map a consensus among the team before we made a solution and what conditions we would, would what conditions we felt like needed to be met in order to move forward. Uh, Ellie mentioned that something important with ethos is thinking about what principles really guide decision making. And I think Using Ethos Light helped us to do the same and, and really put our values and our organizational principles at the center of our decision making. Um, I'm convinced that Global Giving and Ethos are valuable to leaders beyond just the platform space. We as a nonprofit organization found it useful. And I think companies should consider it as a tool for ethically navigating complicated issues. Global Giving's network of nonprofits could act as a well-informed stakeholder group that could be paid to work with companies to address these types of dilemmas as well. Thank you so much, Mahati. Yes, you know, we're hoping that the ethos tools and approach will be useful for many types of companies, and we're hoping to engage directly with a few companies this summer that want help navigating these ethical dilemmas. So all of you out there listening, if you work for a company that might be interested, please do get in touch with us. And we, as, as Mahati was talking about, we're also exploring the idea of pulling together our networks of nonprofit leaders around the world to act as pay, a paid advisory group to serve on ethos councils or to weigh in on specific cases. So that's something we're exploring and let us know if that's something that interests you. And you know, it's funny when, because when, um, you and your colleagues Mahati at CDE first approached me with that idea. Uh, it was actually the third time in a week that someone had asked how Global Giving could not only provide this framework, but also play this powerful role in bringing people together and literally facilitating these conversations about how we can do philanthropy better or how we can partner with others better. So thank you for that idea. It is something that we're actively exploring. And most importantly here, I want to share that Mahati published this case study on the Ethos website, and her nonprofit's approach to telling this story really impacted me as we were talking about, did they feel okay publishing it? In an initial draft that they wrote, I was ready to really paint the clothing company as the, the aggressor in this story because I was frustrated for how long and how much time um, they have really invested into sorting out this problem that was brought on by this company. Um, but CDA's approach was to explicitly resist this idea of cancel culture and really to embody that healing posture that is what ethos is, is founded on. And so it's been a really beautiful expression of the ethos principles that we all developed together a year ago. Um, and I'm just so thankful that they reminded me of that as we were working together on publishing this. Um, so thank you for that, for not only inspiring the solution, Mahati, because you were part of the design team, but also reminding us what it looks like in practice. All right, well, we have um, maybe a minute, um, a minute or two for questions. Ellie, I don't know if you've seen any questions that have popped up that you are able to answer. 
<laughs> sure. Um, thank you for that. One, there have been a number of questions about whether or not we're going to share this recording as well as the presentation, and the answer is yes. Um, though I, um, I want to sort of bring um, perhaps even um, Alex and Allison into this question that, that surfaced um, uh, in the chat from Scott Sherman, um, who says, how has the ethos process responded or taken into account the various cultural norms and values represented in an international organization? And uh, I really loved that question in part because it was it is in part why we developed Ethos to begin with because we're we're a very global company and we are walking working across many different um, cultural norms um, and also many def like legal constructs um, and so really required us to kind of bring that together in a way that's not saying one way is right or one way is wrong but how do we actually gather those perspectives together in order to then lead to an outcome that does represent these differences so um, I. Just, I said we, we both um, have used that. It was sort of core to what drove the development of Ethos, and um, it was also one of our first cases that we had to put through um, and and use. Um, so I don't know, Allison or Alex, if you have anything else you would add to that. But very good question. I see Alex shaking his head. Yeah, I mean that was a challenge because you know we're bringing people together in the same room to talk about difficult things and certain certain cultures, you know, are, are more likely to be more forward about their opinions and others may not actually talk about them. And so we have a very um, clear facilitation guide about like who speaks when and how you respond to one another using a tool called mindful inquiry um, to make sure that everyone is heard from. Um, and that they're responding to one another um, in a creative and generative way. Um, you know, but all the tools I had seen too, there was a question about whether the tools are in other languages. Right now they're all in English. Um, but if, you know, if we see there's a lot of interest, we would, we would love to work with some folks to see if we can translate them into other languages, if that's useful. So that could be something that happens going forward. If we have time for one more question, another great one just came in from Kyle, uh, who raises this question um, that sort of the Mahati touched upon, but how do you foresee ethos promoting ethical decision making within organizations on the receiving end of an ethos based decision framework? And it's one of the reasons why it's such a great um, question is because healing and relationships are so core to the process that we really have also developed thought through, like, if you are on the receiving end, what does that mean for you? And how are like, how do we make sure that this isn't in any way, um, sort of, you know, damaging you or causing harm? Um, and how can we sort of make sure that any develop anything that we're developing is in service of sort of learning and growth. And so those are actually those are also part of the ethos tools um, as part of that. I think this is a quite insightful question. And again, I think it speaks to um, the approach that um, it's inherent in the approach to consider even potentially sort of antagonistic stakeholders uh, with empathy uh, and sort of with intentional empathy. And in fact, we have experienced um, recently the ability to open up a conversation with an organization that was sort of at on the receiving end of a kind of deplatforming decision that that we made, um, and engage in that conversation productively and openly, and with the ability to share, it sort of speaks to this shift in, you know, being confident enough about the approach for a decision that you're then able to talk about it, even when that decision had negative consequences for a particular stakeholder group. So sort of yes to, to that question. And yes, that's that's part of the hope. That's right, thank you. So we've reached the end of the hour. I just wanna thank you all very much for investing your time to hear from Global Giving and our colleagues here. Hope you'll check out globalgiving.org slash ethos and explore for yourself what it might feel like to engage people who are affected by your decisions in your decision-making. Mm -hmm and feel confident about um, providing a clear narrative to your team about why you made a decision. And ultimately what it might feel like to inspire changes that address the root causes of crises so that you can build toward more empathetic, equitable and effective organization. Thank you for being there on this journey and we look forward to hearing from you soon if you're interested in diving in. Thank you very much.